I'm not going to go through the white paper, because it's as long as two PhDs, it's got lots and lots of detail and so on. Rather, I want to talk about the principles. Let's start off with where we are. Fourth highest level of inequality in the world. Second highest level of low pay in the world. Um, the majority of Scottish families are now in fuel poverty. Two thirds of old people live in fuel poverty. But <coughs> apart from Luxembourg and Iceland, which are very small countries, we have the highest level of debt per head of population of any place on the planet. That's public and private sector debt, household debt, and so on. We've also got more bankers and over a million euro a year than the whole of the rest of Europe put together. That includes Switzerland and Germany and so on. So we've got a very imbalanced economy. Manufacturing at its lowest ever level, etc. This week, George Osborne promised us continuing decade of austerity, of cuts, and so forth. Institute of Fiscal Studies have come out yesterday and today saying he's actually underestimated, he's got it wrong. Growth ain't going to be as high, it's not sustainable, therefore there'll have to be deeper cuts. Uh, the debt that Britain faces is going to increase into the future. He reckons it will start uh, reversing by about 2018. Other commentators think that's way over optimistic. All of that suggests, confirms what we know we need to change. That same body, the Institute of Fiscal <coughs> Studies, was the first to come out with a massive tone a couple of weeks ago, saying two things. Firstly, if, if Scotland stays in the UK, it will continue to face all those problems and issues. Secondly, if Scotland comes out of the UK, if it's independent, this is where the Better Together campaign, the media focus, that if we come out of the UK, it'll be even worse. The important message from all from those in-street fiscal studies reports isn't about independence, it's about the failure of that neoliberal regime. Um, and yet I've seen to be passed over. All the focus is on the independence question by those who are against independence. So we need to change, we need to get away from that neoliberal failed economic policy, or at least that fails the vast majority of people in this in Scotland and the rest of the UK. <coughs> Before we start to have a look at the, the white paper, I want to suggest that we need to, to learn from elsewhere. We need to have a look at economic theory. We need to have a look at what practice, what experiences of the countries that have done have been successful, <coughs> done the most successful on the planet. And we need to look inside Scotland to see if there's anything inside Scotland that suggests things can change. If we look at economic theory, then it tends to suggest that successful societies and successful economies are based on certain key phrases, certain key terms, characteristics. Inclusion, diversity, <coughs> cohesion, people working together, trust and cooperation. Um, do we see that demonstrated in Scotland? Very briefly, think back to last weekend and the tragedy in the Cluth of Alts. What did people naturally do? They ran towards the building that had collapsed. They thought it might be a bomb, might be on fire, whatever. They went the opposite way. They went into that. Now, the economic assumptions that underpin the models that the Institute of Fiscal Studies and almost all economists use presumes the opposite. The assumption is you're selfish, that, you, that there's no such thing as altruism and so on. So there's problems with the assumptions the, the Institute of Fiscal Studies have made about oil and so on and so forth, many of us would argue, but there's also difficulties with the assumptions they've made of how homo economicus, economic man, <coughs> um, lives and works and reacts and so on. So that flags up there may be some issues we can return to there. So the theory says, and the practice says, if we look across other countries in Northern Europe, the most successful, they tend to be at the top of all the tables in terms of health and well-being, of prosperity, of gender balance, of press freedom, and so on and so forth. They're up there in just about every single table we can see in the world. What typifies those sorts of societies, the Nordic countries, is the same set of economic <coughs> terms. Resilience, inclusion, diversity, cohesion, trust, cooperation, so on, working together. And we shouldn't forget they got there 
after years of class struggle in the 20s and 30s, occupation by the Nazis and so on. So this idea that big is beautiful, that we need to be in a bigger entity like the UK to be better and richer and so on, is actually undermined by what we can see elsewhere. Now look, can we see any practice in Scotland? The community buyer areas of the Highlands and Islands, I think, give us great examples of what can happen. The Isle of Gia, off the west coast of Argyll, had literally the worst housing in Britain in the 90s. The Laird who owned it wouldn't allow them to develop, wouldn't allow new business to be created and so on. Hostile by, by the community, growing population, more young people, more enterprises, um, generate their own electricity, etc. A huge turnaround, and the housing is much improved. We can see similar success stories in Ascent, in Egg, and so on and so forth. So the theory, the practice elsewhere, and the experiences in Scotland all suggest that there is a different way we can organise a society and so on. The white paper, looking through it, throughout, and including the finance economic paper that went alongside it, hundreds and hundreds of words, uh, pages, but again those same words appear. Resilience, cohesion, inclusion, diversity. You don't find them in George Osborne's budget statement. You won't find them in the biz, in the business and industrial um, science department, the old DTI in London and so on. So there's actually already, it's radical with a small R <coughs> in, in the terminology uses, it's assumptions it makes of how we as people want to live and so on. It's radical as well, and with a small r, in that it reverses some of the recent changes, like the bedroom tax and so on. It's radical because of the way it looks at child care, etc. But, as Jim and John have already said, we want to see something much more radical. Um, and there's the opportunity and the potential to build upon that white paper, I suggest, using those principles, not talking about profit and maximizing our wages, um, because that's the assumption they make, we're all trying to be selfish and so on. The experience we saw last weekend in Glasgow of selfless activity, of actually going against what economists assume gives us a point to forward for how we can reorganise society in Scotland. I've done a lot of work with the Reed Foundation with the Common Wheel, and if you've got a handout, the, f the bullet points at the end of that suggest how we in the Reed Foundation would see Scotland changing and moving forward. What's important isn't the detail here about industries and sectors, and I would suggest even the currency and so on. It's about the principles. It's about how we want to organise, how we want to change Scotland into the future. That's what they did in the Nordic countries. As I said, the most successful in the history of the planet. They're not paradise. We want to see a different site even from there, but we can learn from them. And also, they're beginning to struggle with um, changes in their, in their societies, with migrant <coughs> workers, immigrants, asylum seekers, and so on. And again, I think we've got greater diversity in Scotland, and therefore, this exchange of knowledge and how you can do things isn't going to be one way. <coughs> so I think there's a lot of potential in the white paper. It's something for us to build upon, to argue for things more radical. Um, as you said, it talks about employment rights for workers, Put that together with the community right to buy. One thing some of us started to work on is an employee right to buy. Why shouldn't people have the same rights to take <coughs> over their business? Because the Human Rights Acts and so on, we can't do it just by nationalising, with no compensation. It would be about putting in a bid that is equal to the market value. We have to do that, otherwise we'd face a <coughs> prior state and interest rates would shoot through the roof, etc. But when any of us said Grangemouth was a hopeless case, it was valueless, they found themselves there and told us it's mm -hmm. worth the zero. Mm -hmm. The unions, the workforce, Scotland could have taken that over at the rates they said, which was yeah. valueless. Okay, so thinking cleverly, thinking together, so. Um, so, I welcome the white paper. It's radical in some ways. It gives us the foundations to build a much more radical Scotland, and one that meets the needs of everybody here.